where you see the passing of time. We crowd in St. Peter's Square are praying like mad for the Pope's life. Where moments refuse to die. This is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. And where victory lives on. Plenty of girls are being kissed by plenty of boys they don't know, and they do not care. You can love it, hate it, embrace it, or turn away. Lennon was shot to death late last night outside his apartment building. But it is a past we all share. Come on out here and give me a salute. Take Davey's salute. This is where yesterday has a home, where we wonder what it was like back then. Go forward, knights in safety. And not too long ago. His spirit must live on. It's where history has its place and where the past comes alive. The History Channel. February 15th, 1898. The tropical island of Cuba is in the throes of a bloody struggle to win independence from Spain. Off her coast in Havana Harbor, the U.S. battleship Maine stands a nervous sentinel positioned as a safe haven for Americans in the event of an escalation of violence. For three weeks, 350 American sailors aboard the Maine have kept their tension-filled vigil without incident until 9.40 p.m. this steamy Tuesday night. Accident or sabotage? The answer could mean war. For a century, it's been one of America's most famous battle cries. It's a tale of how one ship's mysterious, violent end forever changed the fate of two nations and the world's balance of power. By October 1897, the island of Cuba had been transformed from Caribbean paradise into one of the world's major trouble spots. For two years, rebel forces had intensified their bloody struggle to win independence from Spain. To suppress the insurrection, the Spanish general in charge, Valeriano Weiler, turned his wrath upon the civilian population in a brutal campaign known as subjugation or death. His army swept the countryside, rounding up peasants and throwing them into concentration camps. More than 200,000 reconcentrados met terrible deaths in the overcrowded, unsanitary conditions, earning Weiler his nickname, The Butcher. A continent away, the American President William McKinley monitored these events with increasing concern. Appalled at Weiler's savage inhumanity, McKinley was keenly aware of the strategic significance an independent Cuba could play in future U.S. trade and expansion. The president also realized that Spain was well aware of American sympathy toward the rebels, a position that might place Americans living on the war-torn isle in jeopardy. As a precautionary measure, McKinley contacted the North Atlantic Squadron stationed in the Gulf of Mexico and ordered a battleship sent post-haste to Key West, Florida, only 90 miles from Cuba. If more violence should erupt, the ship could immediately be dispatched to Havana to rescue American citizens. The ship he selected for this vital mission was the USS Maine. 
One of the main reasons for sending a ship to Havana Harbor was to impress the Spaniards and the Cubans in the area with American naval might. And the Maine seemed to be the perfect ship. It looked good, it was long and low, it had good cruising range, had good speed. It was just about everything you'd want for an independent ship to send to Havana. The USS Maine was among the first armored ships in what was known as the New Navy. Funded in 1886 by a congressional appropriation of two and a half million dollars, the Maine was designed to be distinctive. While most of her predecessors were made of wood and dependent on wind and sails for power, she was made of steel and fueled by her own stores of coal. But above all, at a time when many U.S. ships were designed overseas, the Maine was distinguished for being a completely all-American vessel. The Maine symbolizes a new era in naval expansion and also a new era in American overseas expansion. So you have American society, American policy, American politics, and the United States Navy all expanding at roughly the same time and period in history. The Maine cut a proud figure on the sea but left behind a troubled wake. Early on, she acquired the reputation for being a hoodoo ship, Navy slang for jinxed. During her construction, a fire raged through her incomplete hull. On one early mission, a storm washed three of her crewmen overboard to their deaths. Hoodoo struck again in July of 1897, when the Maine crashed into a New York pier to avoid colliding with an excursion boat full of tourists. The pier was demolished, but the Maine suffered only minor damage. The consequences would have been much worse had it not been for the unflappable leadership of the Maine's commanding officer, Captain Charles Dwight Sigsby. He was a Civil War veteran who had served in various positions on a variety of ships throughout the U.S. Navy. And when he received command of the Maine, he was as eminently qualified to command a United States battleship as any captain in the Navy list. In addition to his fine reputation as a naval officer, Captain Sigsby was something of a Renaissance man, a published author and noted underwater explorer. The versatile Sigsby would have to summon all the intelligence and sensitivity his talents required for what could prove to be his most dangerous assignment, a rescue of Americans from the political flashpoint, Cuba. Sigsby knew that more than lives were at risk here. American political prestige and economic interests were also on the line. Cuba represented the first step in America's expanding global influence and ambitions. With power, money, and hundreds of American lives at stake, the Maine answered President McKinley's call and hastened to Key West, dropping anchor on December 15th. There, the hoodoo ship and her crew awaited the orders that would shortly propel them into history. While the Maine waited in Key West for orders from Washington, public support for a war against Spain was catching fire across the United States, fueled by sensational newspaper reports in what was known as the Yellow Press. The chief purveyors of the early tabloid journalism were two power-hungry publishers with a lust for cutthroat competition. The New York World's Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst of the New York Journal. Hearst denounced his nemesis Pulitzer as a journalist who made his money pandering to the worst tastes of the prurient and horror-loving. Those words could have applied to Hearst himself. His own mother forbade her servants to read his prurient and horror-filled headlines. These two blood rivals waged their own war for circulation supremacy, and Cuba became their battleground. Hearst and Pulitzer read the American people very well. The brutal policy General Weiler had established in Cuba 
irked the American people. These were very repressive schemes and uh, something that uh, read very well, I think, uh, to the American people that had this very high moral code, uh, that oppression of this type uh, should not be allowed. When rioting broke out in Havana in January 1898, President McKinley gave the anticipated order for the main to depart for the Cuban capital. Spanish officials warned that the presence of an American battleship in Havana would be considered an unfriendly act. But Captain Sigsby's instructions expressed the opposite intent. My orders were to proceed to Havana and make a friendly visit. The situation seemed to call for nothing more than a strict adherence to naval procedure and courtesy. The term friendly visit was a diplomatic term. The main going to Havana was kind of a different idea. It was under the guise of a friendly visit. It was permitted by international law to be done, but in actuality it was there to protect American interests in Havana and uh, to either uh, spark trouble or quell trouble if necessary. At 11 a.m. on the morning of January 25th, the Maine's imposing form appeared at the entrance to Havana Harbor. On the battleship's bridge, Captain Sigsby wondered what to expect, knowing he must avoid appearing hostile while still remaining alert for any possible danger. Sigsby chose a cautious approach, ordering the crew to take up positions not at, but near their battle stations in case of enemy attack. All stood by their posts, ready, waiting. Tension passed from deck to deck as the main glided beneath the guns of the Morrow Castle fort. Suddenly, a Spanish vessel approached. It was the harbor pilot coming out to guide the main to her mooring berth. The routine procedure occurred without incident. The next day, Captain Sigsby sent a message back to Washington. We have passed the night without excitement. Evidently, the main looks too formidable for trifling purposes. Ever mindful of his sensitive political position, Captain Sigsby followed the protocols of a friendly visit to the letter, ordering every appropriate greeting and salute to be exchanged between the Maine's officers and their Spanish hosts. Yet beneath the veneer of diplomatic cordiality lurked suspicion. Captain Sigsby took extraordinary precautions to ensure the safety of the Maine intensifying the security detail and forbidding his crew to leave the ship. These measures created an anxious mood amongst the crew. One sailor expressed the fear shared by his comrades in a letter to his family. I am ready to do my duty when called on, but I tell you, it is not a pleasant feeling to sit here and think that the harbor is full of mines. Despite the sailors' fears, the likelihood of a mine striking the main seemed remote as the second week of her friendly visit ended without incident. Still, the captain remained vigilant against treachery, posting sentries about the ship and having all boarding visitors searched. But all of Sigsby's efforts to maintain the tenuous peace could not prevent the ill-timed indiscretion of Enrique Dupuy de Lome, the Spanish ambassador to the United States. On February the 8th, Cuban rebels intercepted a personal letter from de Lome to a friend in Madrid and leaked the inflammatory missive to the scandal-hungry New York Journal. The letter dismissed President McKinley as a weak and low politician. The journal's publisher, William Randolph Hearst, triumphantly proclaimed it the scoop of the year. The Dupuy de Lome letter led to a great outrage and outpouring of emotion in the United States. President McKinley had been grossly insulted. 
The American press came out with huge headlines that this was the worst insult the United States had uh, had ever undergone since its inception. Uh, that Spanish perfidy and uh, Spanish lies stood fully exposed, and the Spanish ambassador uh, was no longer welcome in the United States. It was a huge diplomatic flap. The humiliated Delone resigned. But the American public, inflamed by Hearst's editorials, demanded more. U.S. officials pressed for a formal apology. Spain resisted. Just one week after Delone had been exposed, relations between the two countries continued to chill. Rendering the USS Maine, the lone American force in hostile Cuban water, increasingly vulnerable. February 15, 1898. In the humid stillness of the Caribbean night, Captain Charles Sigsby paced the decks of the USS Maine. Satisfied that all was secure and in order, Sigsby retired to his cabin after another long, uneventful day. Under a steamy, overcast sky, Havana Harbor lay almost unnaturally quiet. At 9.10 p.m., the ship's bugler blew taps. With the exception of the sentry's standing watch, the crew of the main turned in for the night. Alone in his quarters, Captain Sigsby put the finishing touches on a letter to his wife. It would never be sent. At 9.40 p.m. on February 15, 1898, the battleship USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor. The blast sent shockwaves through the streets of the city, shattering windows and ripping doors off their hinges. The hoodoo ship had been cursed once again. Sigmund Rothschild, a passenger on the city of Washington, an American steamer in the harbor, witnessed the spectacle from his deck chair. I heard a shot, like a cannon shot. It made me look toward the main. I saw the bow rise a little. After a few seconds, there came a terrible mass of fire and explosion, a black mass. Then we heard a noise of falling material. It didn't take a minute before the bow went down. There was a cry, help, Lord God, save us, help, help. The cry didn't last a minute or two. On board the main, Captain Sigsby, alone in his cabin, was signing off a letter to his wife when the explosion occurred. As I was placing the letter in an envelope, I heard a bursting, rending, and crashing noise of deafening volume. This was followed by a succession of heavy, ominous sounds like tearing metal. The main trembled and lurched. All lights went out. There was only intense blackness and smoke. Captain Sigsby groped his way through the wreckage strewn darkness. In a passageway, he collided with Marine Private William Anthony, who informed him that the main was sinking rapidly. Sigsby, assuming the ship was under attack, rushed to the highest deck and ordered sentries posted. But he realized that command was futile once he saw the enormity of the disaster. People were just snuffed out. People were horribly burned and scalded. Some of their compartments in the forward end of the ship were thrown completely upside down and backwards on each other, and the men in them were as well. Uh, they fell several decks, uh, they had their mouths filled with hot ashes, uh, several were burned horribly, they were blown over the side. Sigsby made out what he called white forms in the water and heard faint cries for help. To his horror, he realized they were his men. 
no one can ever know the awful scenes of consternation and despair and suffering down in the forward compartments of the ship. Scenes of men wounded or drowning in the swirl of water or confined in a closed compartment, gradually filling with water. Sigsby shouted orders to lower lifeboats for the drowning men, but only three of the ship's 15 could be reached. Meanwhile, other vessels in the harbor, including the city of Washington, joined in the rescue effort, valiantly plucking men from the flaming waters. On board the main, Captain Sigsby and several officers stood in the center of an infernal cacophony. As ammunition magazines exploded, and air screeched through the bursting seams of watertight compartments. After several minutes, the main's boats, filled with the wounded, returned to pick up Captain Sigsby and the others. It was a hard blow to abandon the main. None of us wanted to leave while any part of the deck remained above water. I waited until satisfied that the ship was resting on the bottom of the harbor, and then directed everyone into the boats. I was the last man to leave. As the main slipped beneath Havana Harbor to her underwater grave, Captain Sigsby and the other dazed survivors were taken aboard the city of Washington. Rescuers converted the cruise ship's dining salon into a makeshift hospital, while medical volunteers made a quick assessment of the dozens of wounded. The carnage was appalling. One Spanish doctor tended to the shattered face of a sailor who was muttering, there's something in my eyes, wait and let me open them. The doctor caught his breath as he realized both of the man's eyes were gone. Soon after the initial blast, Spanish officials boarded the rescue ship, expressing their sympathy and assuring Captain Sigsby that they knew nothing about the cause of the disaster. The captain cited their concern in a telegram to John Long, Secretary of the Navy, that included a plea from Sigsby that all public opinion should be suspended until further report. It was after midnight when Captain Sigsby received the worst news of all, the casualty count. Of the Maine's 350 officers and men, only 94 were still alive. Eight would later die of their wounds. The other 252 had perished, many of them entombed in the sunken ship. Until Pearl Harbor, it would be the largest single loss of American sailors' lives in U.S. naval history. At daylight, Captain Sigsby gazed upon the wreckage that had once been the pride of the U.S. Navy. What had taken nearly seven years to build took less than half an hour to sink. After much reflection, Sigsby sent a secret message to Secretary Long. Maine probably destroyed by mine, perhaps by accident. I presume that her birth was planted prior to our arrival. I can only surmise this. Back in Washington, President McKinley called an emergency meeting with Naval Secretary Long and other cabinet members. While on the streets of America's cities, the yellow press boosted its sails with incendiary headlines. Joseph Pulitzer printed the captain's supposedly secret telegram in the New York world. Not to be outdone, William Randolph Hearst offered New York Journal readers a $50,000 reward for information leading to the capture of the guilty party. Hearst won the circulation war that day, selling over a million copies, an all-time high. Agitated by the newspapers, outraged Americans blamed the Spaniards for the main explosion and demanded retaliation. But President McKinley preached patience. We must learn the truth and endeavor, if possible, to fix the responsibility. 
The country can afford to withhold its judgment and not strike an avenging blow until the truth is known. To quell the hysteria, President McKinley dispatched a court of inquiry to Cuba to determine the cause of the explosion and who was responsible for it. The panel, made up of four senior naval officers, arrived in Havana on February 21st. They immediately began questioning all survivors and witnesses, while a team of Navy divers probed the depths of Havana Harbor for underwater clues. Several days of detailed testimony began to cast doubt on the possibility that the main explosion was caused by an accident. According to surviving crew, any likely internal source of the blast, from the boilers to the coal bunkers, had been inspected shortly before taps that night and found to be in safe and satisfactory condition. Meanwhile, the Navy divers had completed their own inspection of the main. They'd found that some of the bottom plating was bent inward and the ship itself twisted into the shape of an inverted V. Such massive damage, the team concluded, supported the likelihood that the main had been blown up by a tremendous external force, probably a mine. Who would have the motivation to blow up the main? Surprisingly, those least motivated would be the Spanish. A war with the United States would be an unmitigated catastrophe. Those with reason to do that, however, would be the Cuban rebels. The Cuban rebels desperately wanted an American intervention in Cuba, under whatever reason, to throw the Spanish out and uh, give the island independence. However, the Cuban rebels didn't have the wherewithal at all to put together a mine, nor would they be able to approach the ship with the security precautions that Captain Sigsby took. The questions were many, definitive answers were few. For the conclusions of this inquiry were about to set off a chain reaction from Washington to Madrid that would be far more explosive than whatever destroyed the main. During the four weeks the Court of Inquiry conducted its investigation in Havana, rumors about the main disaster were sweeping every corner of America. Everyone had an opinion on how the ship blew up and what villains must have engineered it. Secretary of the Navy Long noted in his diary where the lines of debate were drawn. If he is a conservative, he is sure that it was an accident. If he is a jingo, he is equally sure that it was by design. Jingo was a term used to describe those who were rabidly patriotic. And no one in America was a more outspoken jingo than Theodore Roosevelt, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. It is certainly possible that the ship was blown up by a mine. The main was sunk by an act of dirty treachery on the part of the Spaniards. Theodore Roosevelt knew that Cuba and other Spanish possessions in the Caribbean blocked total American hegemony of the area. Uh, to get Spain out of the Western Hemisphere would naturally take a war. And Theodore Roosevelt was all for a war to advance American international interests. Assistant Secretary Roosevelt pushed President McKinley to take a bolder stance against Spain. The president, awaiting the court's report, stood firm in withholding his judgment. His patience was lambasted in the yellow press. William Randolph Hearst, editorializing in the New York Journal, condemned McKinley, claiming he was ready to surrender every particle of national honor and dignity. The president could rise above such blatant attacks. What he could not ignore, however, were the initial findings trickling from the inquiry. It seemed increasingly likely that a mine had destroyed the main. A mine meant sabotage, and sabotage meant war. McKinley was in a precarious position. He needed to remain neutral until the investigation's report was released, while still ensuring that the nation was ready to fight. Compelled by the Jingo factions in Congress, he requested passage of a military appropriations bill totaling $50 million, an astronomical sum at the time. 
So the fact that the president asked for $50 million and the fact that Congress approved that appropriation in record time meant that there was a feeling in Congress, a very conservative Congress, that uh, war with Spain uh, was in fact inevitable. Into this bellicose atmosphere, the Court of Inquiry released its long-awaited final report on March 28th. In its conclusion, the court asserted that the loss of the Maine was caused neither by accident nor negligence on the part of her officers or crew, but by the intentional explosion of a mine. Members of the panel were careful to note, however, that there was no visible evidence as to who might have planted it. The conclusion benefited everyone except for the Spanish. Uh, it got Captain Sigsby and his senior officers off the hook quite well. Uh, it was a good answer for the U.S. Navy. Our ships are safe, and we don't design bad ones, and they don't blow up by accident. Our stuff is good. The American public's reaction to the court's report was expressed in a slogan that echoed across the nation. To hell with Spain, remember the Maine. Enraged patriots ignored the fact that the court did not fix blame for the explosion of the ship. To the man in the street, there was only one culprit, Spain. The din of so many Americans clamoring for war entirely drowned out the news that a Spanish court of inquiry had come to some different conclusions about the disaster. This court asserted that the main explosion couldn't possibly have been caused by a mine, based on the fact that not one eyewitness had reported any one of the phenomena usually accompanying mine blasts, such as a tower of water or masses of dead fish lying alongside the ship. The Spanish investigators even went a step further. They sent a team of divers to search for the physical evidence that a mine would have left behind. That was a, quite a reasonable thing to do, and it's surprising that the Americans never bothered looking for either remnants of a mine, mine casing, or wires that would have to have been hundreds of yards long leading to shore emplacements with gizmos there to, to uh, ignite the mine. Uh, the Spanish went looking for that and found none. Though persuasive, the Spaniards' arguments were diluted by the limited scope of their investigation. They did not have access to the wreck, nor did they question any of the main survivors. Consequently, their report was dismissed as politically motivated, or, in the words of Captain Sigsby, a fish story. In Washington, Roosevelt and other Capitol Hill jingoes increased their pressure on President McKinley to declare war on Spain. McKinley still resisted. Without knowing who had planted the mine, he reasoned there was no one against whom to declare war. But the taciturn president was clearly in turmoil. As political urgency for aggression mounted, McKinley's personal aversion to war became evident. President McKinley had served during the Civil War and saw tremendous carnage in the battlefield as a young officer. He certainly did not want to send American boys to that type of fate again. He was very cognizant of his responsibility to try to promote peace. Pressured by a nation hungry for war, yet torn by the force of his personal convictions, President McKinley continued to seek a diplomatic solution to the crisis. In a last desperate move toward compromise, the president succeeded in convincing Spain to agree to a ceasefire with the Cuban rebels, but failed to persuade her to set the island of Cuba free. Under incessant pressure from the Jingo faction in Congress, McKinley finally gave in and delivered an ultimatum. Spain must grant Cuba independence or face prompt military intervention by the United States. Spain responded by ordering the American ambassador out of Madrid. On April 25th, 1898, the inevitable became reality. The United States declared war on Spain, a war triggered by the explosion of the USS Maine.
With the rallying cry, Remember the Maine, thousands of Americans marched off to fight the Spaniards. The three-month-long war made thrilling copy for the headline insatiable yellow press. On land, the conflict climaxed when Teddy Roosevelt, who had resigned his post as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, led the Rough Riders in a dashing charge up San Juan Hill, assuring Cuban independence. At sea, Commodore George Dewey's Asiatic Squadron annihilated the Spanish fleet in the Philippines, fulfilling the promise of a world-class navy born with the main. So swift and complete was the American victory that not even William Randolph Hearst could have conjured it up in his most sensational headline. In the words of Secretary of State John Hay, the Spanish-American conflict was a splendid little war. To a degree, it certainly was. It lasted three months. American casualties were, in the whole, under 300 people. Uh, we acquired an empire virtually by default from Spain, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, Guantanamo Bay. Uh, we acquired hemispheric hegemony over North America. And the United States now took its place as one of the great powers in the world a nation to be reckoned with. But long after the last cheer for America's homecoming heroes echoed away, the ship that incited the war still lay, a twisted, rusted wreck in the center of Havana Harbor. It was not until 1908, the 10th anniversary of the conflict, that public sentiment emerged to raise her. One of the reasons the main uh, had to be raised from Havana Harbor was that it was becoming an obstruction to commerce and other activities. And there was also a desire, a very strong desire, to find uh, the rest of the bodies that uh, had not uh, floated up to the surface. In 1911, over 60 crewmen of the Maine remained entombed in her disfigured hull, and in reverence to their memories, work to salvage her began. The Army Corps of Engineers supervised construction of a coffer dam surrounding the wreck, allowing the enclosed water to be pumped out. The entire project took nearly a year. With the wreckage completely exposed, a second Court of Inquiry arrived in Havana to begin its inspection. After much study, it came to the same conclusion as had the original court. A mine had destroyed the main. They determined this by a complete photographic record of the wreck, and they found some indented plates on the port side a bit further aft of the bent keel. And from this, they deduced that a mine indeed had set off the powder magazines. In February 1912, after the Court of Inquiry finished its investigation, the wrecking crew began the task of preparing the ship for burial at sea. They removed the twisted mass of the bow and affixed a bulkhead to the after section. Pumps poured water back into the coffer dam and the main, or what was left of it, was floating in Havana Harbor for the first time since the explosion. At sunrise on the morning of March 16, 1912, the citizens of Havana awoke to a cannon shot. The first formal burial at sea of an American naval vessel. The last rites of the USS Maine had begun. Simulating the tolling of a bell, a gunshot rang out every half hour. The ceremony commenced with a memorial service in Havana for the 67 men whose remains had been recovered from the wreck. Afterwards, 
Sailors placed their coffins on the battleship North Carolina for transport to Arlington National Cemetery and burial alongside their comrades. With two more cannon blasts, the final voyage of the Maine began. The Maine had been especially prepared for this day. Roses covered her decks, and an American flag waved from her mast. She would not sink without her nation's colors. On shore, 80,000 Cubans watched the procession. Men removed their hats as the once proud ship left their harbor for the last time. Four miles out from Havana in international waters, the army engineers briefly boarded the main to open the ship's valves. As water rushed in and the main began to sink, the Marine Band on the North Carolina played the national anthem. Johnny O'Brien, the tugboat captain, spoke for many that day. In no way could she have met a sweeter or more peaceful end. The sea beckoned her, and she went swiftly and gladly to its bosom. At 5.30 p.m., the USS Maine was gone. The roses from her deck floated above the burial site. The Maine would not rest in peace. Ever since the blast, haunting questions lingered, leaving many historians and naval experts harboring serious doubts about the official explanation of the explosion. It's quite self-evident. You would not have a mine where ships are crowded in a mooring area. Uh, it does not protect the harbor whatsoever. Uh, that, would have, that would have been at the harbor entrance, not in the middle of the roadstead where ships are anchoring. It's just a no-brainer to think otherwise. That in all the years since the Maine has blown up, no one ever did and no one has come forward to say that they knew anybody, heard anything, or came up with any reason why that was ever done. Well, the reason nobody said anything was it didn't happen. In 1974, Admiral Hyman Rickover and naval experts initiated yet another investigation to determine once and for all how the main exploded. Applying data gathered from World War II battleship explosions to the detailed photographic record compiled by the Second Court of Inquiry, the Rickover team found a much different cause for the main disaster than those of the two previous investigations. Dana Wagner was a member of the Rickover team. The team could not rule out the possibility of spontaneous combustion of coal that caused the magazine to explode and there was no evidence of anything on the outside of the ship instigating the explosion of the forward magazines of the main. Therefore, the explosion was solely within the, the confines of the ship and had to be an accidental explosion. Could an accident have triggered a war? Perhaps that was a truth Americans did not want to face in 1898. The only questions the original court asked about the possibility of spontaneous combustion of coal in the bunkers concerned whether the standard inspections at the time had been followed. Ship personnel testified that they had and that the bunkers were found safe. All of that was inadequate to, to overcome what basically was a design flaw in the ship, that they had put the bunker right up against the magazine. No longer a battle cry, Remember the Maine has become an elegy. To memorialize her, more than 400 communities and institutions throughout the United States besieged the federal government for salvaged parts of the vessel. What would have been sold as scrap was given away as cherished keepsakes of history.
I think the main should be remembered because it was a tragedy. And in my, my mind, I feel sorry for all the enlisted men that died. It was too bad that they all died in an accident like that. Who were these young men? In a sense, they were America itself. Not only were they from New England and New York, but they were from Norway, Russia, Japan. And isn't that what America of the 1890s was all about? The main truly was the symbol of uh, America at uh, its most glorious period. It has become part of our tradition, part of the myth of America, and certainly part of the American legacy. Years after the disaster, Admiral Sigsby reflected on his lost command. I shall always remember the main with as much pride as any commander could possibly feel. The men who were lost with the main were as worthy and true patriots as those we have lost in battle. Their fate was a sadder one. As the main lies barnacled beneath the waters, she is no longer a brash symbol of naval might, but a wise reminder from history. When warring nations clash, the sea defends no cause. She simply serves as the stage on which conflict can be resolved until peace can reign once more.